Okay, so uh, our, the next thing I want to talk about related to our backlinks, we'll do the Google backlinks in a moment, but um, you saw in my example that that client has a lot of links going to the site. And you say, I want those links too. I want to get other websites linking to my website. How do I, how do I get that? That's what I'm going to talk about right now. So uh, the, the way we get, in short, the way we get links to our website is to have good content. So that's sort of a catch-22, isn't it? I want uh, websites to link to my website, so I need to have good content. But in order to have good content, maybe I need pages linking to my site. I need audience. Well, definitely you want to work on getting good content, and then that's when good links come your way. So it is more of that type of relationship. And what I mean about content is, uh, okay, you're selling products, and maybe you've got a really great uh, baby stroller that you really think people should buy. Not everyone's going to buy it. But other content that you could offer on your website is then maybe a monthly blog post about parenting tips. You know, something that is still useful to people for free that entices people to come back to your site when you've got a new blog post and maybe eventually they become uh, a consumer. But offering content that people care about is a way to get links. I'm going to show you more concrete ways right now. But if you uh, if you got the if you got the syllabus, you should uh, you should know there's a I, I mentioned it before, but uh, there's a little section on recommendations, and I recommend two books. So I'm going to look at I'm going to give you an excerpt out of a couple of pages from the book. I do recommend you. You maybe invest in the book. It costs three dollars and ninety nine cents. Last time I looked at it, and it's got some great uh, SEO techniques. This is in the syllabus at the bottom, and it's SEO twenty fourteen and beyond. Search engine optimization will never be the same again. Uh, I'm going to show you how it looks like here. I bought it as the digital version, so it's on Kindle. I don't have a Kindle, but every device has a Kindle app. So I can see the book on my Windows phone. I can see it on my iPad. I can see it on the website. This is the book that I recommend from Amazon. It's like $3.99. Um, and what I want to show you about it is there's a chapter in here where it gives us concrete information on what to do to get these links. Uh, let me see, somewhere here... Okay, the best backlinks. Okay, so the very best backlinks, or links to your site, that you can get to your site are the ones you do not create. These are backlinks from other sites where you did not request the link, nor did you have any say in the anchor text that is used in the link. This type of backlink is the holy grail of backlinks. So there's many levels, many types of backlinks that I can get. The best one is like that Zagat article. We didn't pay them for the review. We didn't ask them, please review us. They found out through word of mouth or whatever way, they found out about the tacos, they ate the tacos, and they wrote a review. One of the best 15 tacos in the US. Perfect, great link. Uh, that's the kind of links that we want to get most often. The other types of links that we get are still pretty good, but these are the holy grail. These are also the most difficult to get. Um, the best way of getting this type of link is to develop content that your visitors love and want to share with others via their social media channels. Develop content on your site that other site owners will want to link to. So if I'm a, if I'm a review, if I want to do tech reviewing, tech blogs, I want the other big names in, in, uh, in tech journalism to link to me. Uh, Daring Fireball, PC World, um, John Gruber, etc. Uh, I want those links to come to my site with good content. I want to make like the most exclusive review of this new device that no one else has, has reviewed yet. That entices people to come to my site. Uh, here are some more examples, uh, some really good, some good ones here. Uh, infographics. These are graphical representations of complex topics. They are very popular items to share on social channels, such as Pinterest. They are also often reposted on other sites. When you create and post an infographic on your site, you can include instructions to other webmasters telling them how they can boost 
or how they can post your infographic on their site. Okay, what's an infographic? Let me show you a perfect example here. One of my colleagues, Chuck, has a great presence on Pinterest. Pinterest.com slash Mosher13. Mosher13. He is a Pinterest superstar, former student, current colleague. Um, he's on Pinterest, and he's got a little bit of a following. 36,000 followers. <laughs> so he's posting content on Pinterest about web design, typography, uh, fun stuff, um, what else? Infographics, cool photos, tattoos, etc. So he's posting a variety of content that people are paying attention to. Uh, Specifically, the one I want to show you here is in his board of infographics. If you don't know what an infographic is, it's better to show you what one is. You've probably seen them. These are graphical representations of data. Um, let me see what this one is here. Just a lot to choose from. see this one. Five ways to increase Facebook engagement. Okay, this could have easily been a Facebook, uh, this could have easily been a blog post, a dry blog post with one picture. You see those everywhere. But this is much more interesting uh, because infographics are very visual, information graphic, infographic. Facebook leads all social networks in active sharing of content. And then here's a pie chart that should show uh, the breakdown of social networks, who has the most activity and traffic and all of that. Uh, this, the biggest chunk here is Facebook. So we have email, Twitter, Yahoo, etc. I can't read it. But these are the different ways that people can share on social media. Facebook. Now imagine that was a very boring uh, Excel document that had Facebook here 500, Twitter here 200, just very plain data. But here they visualized it. People are more apt to read this and care and care about it and pay attention to it when it's interesting to look at. That's the the heart of an infographic. So. What do we have? Figure out what people want from your Facebook fan page. According to these statistics, and the thing about infographics is they often are full of statistics, but they come from reputable sources. You, you can make up an infographic and put up any data you want, but when it has a link back to the reputable source, people pay attention more. So here it's saying that coupons are very popular on Facebook, so perhaps I want to put some sort of Facebook post uh, that has a coupon. People love 10% off, 20% off, buy one, get one free, buy two, get one free, whatever coupon that entices people to share. Giveaways, even better, sweepstakes, etc. So again, this could have been a very dry PowerPoint presentation, but it's interesting, it's colorful, it's well designed. It takes more effort to do an infographic, but it's one of the best ways to create content that people could link to your site for. Is there an easy way to create an infographic? Like, what program would you use if you're not really super graphic designer person? There's a software out there. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember any, but there's software out there. If you look up uh, infographic generator, uh, there's software out there that will take your data and try to generate something interesting. But uh, but honestly, these are hard to do. These require some effort, some style knowing some software, you could do this in Illustrator, you could do it in Photoshop, probably also Word and, uh, and PowerPoint, but it is more leaning toward the graphic aspect of things, and if we're not a graphical user uh, or graphically skilled, it might be a bit hard to work with this type of content, but there's other ones we can look at. But I would look up WordPress, uh, I mean, uh, infographic uh, generating software. Question? There are, I found sites that have 
based on your site? How did that affect your SEO? It's code. Like, but it's not original and necessarily yours, but it may give you permission to use it. What, what's the code about? What, what? It's, well, it's the infographic itself. It's, a, it's an infographic that's already made and they're giving you the code to put on your site? Yeah. Um, that helps you some, but most likely the code is set up to drive traffic back to them. So you'll get some of the traffic of it, but mostly where you got it from will get the traffic. So if there's a, if there's a way that perhaps, like oftentimes, okay, if I click on this, it goes to the original location. And oftentimes you're going to see on the original, yeah, maybe the code, but maybe even something like this right there, share. I think that's a share, Jaime. That means I like, I like it. I like you. Something. I love. I love. Okay, uh, tweet. I guess that has no French translation. <laughs> tweet. So um, try to look for that. Instead of the code, see if there's any button that lets you directly share your, your content. Now, if you want to put it on your own site, that might be other issues. So again, here's the 80-20. If with an infographic, it's much more recommended that you make your own infographic. But again, that's the, one of the most complicated things to do. At the very least, yeah, share it on your Twitter, on your Facebook, copy the code, and it helps you. But the best is that it's your original content on your site. So info, I'm curious to infographic templates. Look at that, I'm searching for infographic, and I get infographic templates. Maybe I can browse around here and someone's got 1,600 infographic design templates. Okay, maybe I take that into Photoshop and put in my picture and I'm done. Four dollars. Might be worth it. Regular license, extended license, 60. This actually reminds me, um, if you're not graphically inclined, you could go to graphicriver.net, which is part of the larger Envato marketplace, which has a variety of WordPress themes, pre-made code, video, um, like stock footage and such, audio stock footage, and in this case, Graphic River is a place where you could go to get some infographic templates. If you get an account at Envato.com, they give you access to all of their all of their locations, all of their features. Are these free, the Graphic River? It depends. Most of them are not. This is a place that is selling uh, content uh, pretty affordably. But uh, that one that I just saw a moment ago was only $4. So something like this. I have some data that I want to show. Okay, I've got Victor's Bakery, and I have my statistics that show me that October is our busiest month because people love to buy October treats. So I could put together an infographic that the most busy month is October, and then a little blur. And the second most is Christmas, and then I put a blur. So this pre-made graphic, I just fill it with my content, and I've got an infographic. So would you, or would it come blank, or would it have the text on there? It'll come blank with the placeholders. It'll look like this, and you just click it and then fill in your details. But you would have to use Photoshop, or? Uh, I'm not sure. Probably just check out the, the description somewhere. This says it comes with JPEG, vector, EPS, and Illustrator file. So you would open it in, in one of those? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, envato.com and graphicriver.net, those two sites I recommend for, for content creation. And then I, I recommend my colleague Chuck's Pinterest account, pinterest.com slash Mosher13, because he, has, uh, he shares a lot of great content related to web design, SEO, programming, etc.
that's item one here on infographics. Okay, that's one thing to do. Basically, we're, we're working on the content aspect of the three pillars. What content do you provide? What do you provide that your competitors don't? You know, everyone's a lawyer, everyone's a web designer, everyone's a comic shop owner, everyone has something that they uh, can provide that someone else doesn't. So what can you provide that they don't? For example, what I often see is in, in web design, um, many companies uh, have a, uh, a menu about this costs this and this costs that, and that I think might limit people from, from, uh, from hiring a web designer because um, I think that there's no one size fits all. You can't charge an exact amount for every type of web project. So what we offer is that we have this 30-minute consultation for free where we talk, what's your business, where do you want to go with it, what do you want to do with it, here's what we can offer. We have this variety of packages and such. And uh, I think that's something that is not offered enough, so that's something that we would offer that is unique. So you have to think about what, uh, what do you offer that others don't. Something like free information on your website. You're a realtor. Make one of these little infographics that show what are the, what are the trends in real estate. And that could get you links back to your site, traffic to your site, <coughs> helps your SEO. What I've also got here, this one, uh, I don't like this one too much. It depends on what your, your site is about. Scripts and tools that people will bookmark and share. So if you're some sort of site that can give away content like code or some sort of um, currency converter, someone might find it useful and share it. But that's, again, a very technical thing to do. So I would just skip number two. Uh, number three, I don't put as much stock into it. Um, as it would seem, forums and places where people can come to interact with each other in your niche. For example, if you had a website on Husky Dogs, then a forum would attract Husky owners, who would then recommend your site to their friends through their social channels. The problem with that is that now you have to become a moderator. You could turn on forums or comments on your website pretty easily. WordPress has that ability. But if you're not on top of moderating it, it can quickly devolve into flame wars and shouting matches and just bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have something like that, you're going to need to go in and ban that person, block that thing, approve that comment. And you're going to spend more time on that moderation than actually having fun with your content. Uh, so forums, they have their use. I don't put as much stock into them, especially because of the effort put into it. But there's other things we could look at. Free downloads, like software or PDFs, that people find useful. If you can give these away and people really do find them useful, your URL will be shared with their friends on forums they frequent and through social media channels. So let me show you an example of that. On my website, pmdinteractive.com, under the blog, we've got there a free PDF about techniques for uh, having a good password. You hear all the time about people getting hacked and their photos stolen and their credit cards. One of the big reasons is because weak passwords. Um, short answer is, how many of you raise your hand? Here's the same password for everything. No shame here. Raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to assume most of you are doing it, but don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> That's one of the weakest things you can do in security. If someone logs, is able to get into your uh, Hotmail account with that password, and you've used that password on your Wells Fargo account, they could potentially have access to your Wells Fargo account. So if you read my free PDF here, it's like 10 pages long with a lot of graphics. It's almost an infographic. Download it, read it, and you'll see some techniques to protect yourself from, from your password being stolen. One, one way is to have a different password for each site. You think, I'm going to remember 40 different passwords? Yes and no. There's a technique that you can create different passwords per site based on a common root. It sounds more complicated than it is. Read the PDF. You'll get it. But this is what 
number four is saying, create content that people will want to share. And as you see here on, on, this, on this one, uh, this has got some social shares, some like, uh, some activity on, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google+, and there's an easy way here to share it via email, copy the link, etc. So creating content that people will want to share, to link to. Number four. Number five, this is a good one also. Posts that include lists are the types of posts people love to share on other websites like forums, in comments, on other blogs, and via their social channels. For example, top 10 WordPress plugins on a site about building websites would be very interesting to people interested in building WordPress sites. A post like this would get a lot of social shares, plus other sites will link to it. So how many of you have seen something on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn that was the top five whatever, and you read it, and then on the page, on the sidebar, in the footer, there's another top five this, top ten that, and you read three more. A lot of people do that. Very popular. Those chunks of information, top five this, top ten that, top twelve, whatever. People love those. They love to, instead of reading a big, dry paragraph, even looking at this, this is a top ten list here. Number three, number four, number five. I can read the headline and jump to it and read it or read the headline and don't care and go to the next one. And then if you've got many of these on your foot or your, your sidebar, whatever, you'll entice people to go to more of your content, share your content, and if you make it easy to share your content, which WordPress does, right there, you can tweet that right now. Click tweet, it will tweet it. It goes out there. And these are relatively easy to do. Top 5 list, top 3 list, top whatever, top 42 list. It's your opinion. It, it's not wrong, whatever you want to put into it. Uh, and if it's interesting, then it could be shared and gets you more traffic. All right, so I don't want to show too much of that book. I probably violated copyright enough already. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to buy it. It's only $3.99 or, or so on Amazon. Remember, it's on the syllabus. It's the SEO 2014 and beyond. You'll get much more techniques on what you can do, like other sources of backlinks, etc., etc. Check that out on your own. Any questions on any of the these topics we've talked about in this book? Okay, let's. Um, what we, what I've been writing, uh, what I've been talking about so far, actually has been. Um, I've got it in a document for you, but I didn't print it out. So if you want a copy of that, let's do this. Let's go to the desktop. Let's go to computer, the computer screen. Let's go to the classroom data drive Z. Let's go to the Z drive in computer. We'll go to my folder, Campos SEO. Open Campos SEO and copy. Don't double click it. You want to copy it or drag it to the desktop so you get a copy of it. Uh, copy it right here, Campos SEO number three, backlinks. Copy that to your desktop or flash drive or whatever and you can email it to yourself, or uh, you can send me an email and I'll email it to you. <coughs> During the break you can print it, but not at the moment, please. Uh, once you copy it, open it up, and then we'll take a look what I've got here for you.
So copy that PDF and we'll take a look at it. So it's two pages long, uh, and uh, the big focus here is the uh, is backlinks. So what are they? Why are they important? We just talked about that. We want links to quality links to your website. Um, those are the two books that I talked that I that I talked about. Uh, I didn't talk about the checklist. You can look at that on your own. But that excerpt that I showed you was from the first one, SEO 2014 and beyond. There's a direct link. I don't get a I don't get a cut or a kickback from it. I just it's a good book. It's a good pair of books I, I recommend. Um, especially for the for the techniques like I just showed you. I've got then a section of finding your backlinks. We did the one for Bing. Here it is again. If you want to get back to it, you go to the dashboard, reports and data, inbound links, and it's all there. You want to uh, click the export all if you want the data. Uh, we'll look at uh, Google in a moment. There's the webmaster tools. And uh, the thing is, as I said last time, Bing webmaster tools is a thing and Google Analytics is a thing. And they're both different different um, uh, tools and maybe eventually they'll be merged into one. They have different purposes. Google Analytics is the one that gives you all of this deep data uh, about the time uh, spent on your site and just a lot of data. Um, Google Webmaster Tools, it's more like, from what I see, just to confirm that Google knows your site exists and that there's no errors with it. But all of the deep data is in analytics. So every month, at the, at the start of a new month, for most of my clients, we provide them a report where we look at these three tools and synthesize information, give them a report, it's a couple of pages long, and say this is what your traffic was like last month, this is what it is now, how it's increased or decreased or whatever. What we did for the month, like we had a, a, a Twitter um, campaign where we were tweeting towards celebrity chefs, and here was the result. We got two new follows, we got 20 retweets, whatever. So we, we give them, part of the contract that we have is we give them this monthly report. And a lot of that data comes from these things. So this is something that I do for clients, and this is something that, I, that I'm showing you because of its importance. This is how you know that this stuff is working. The Google Analytics screen to show me my backlinks is more complicated to, to find. So I'm going to log in and show you how that looks like in a moment. But... Um, Continuing in my PDF here, uh, after you find out what your links are, your backlinks, your incoming links, it's got several names, backlinks, incoming links, inbound links. After you find out what you do with those links, what do you do with them? And that's when I showed you the demonstration. I found that link, I tweeted about it. This is what this is saying here, taking advantage of your backlinks. Now that you have backlinks report, you can create more authority for your site. The tactic is to link quality content, is to link to quality content that links, let's see, the tactic is to link quality content to the links that link to your own site. It sounds like a Dr. Seuss quote. For example, tweet about a positive restaurant review. On Facebook, post about a link to a blog post that positively reviewed your product. So a link to a link. In the book, the strategy is outlined best in the section Backlinks to Backlinks, in page 1150. The more good content is pointed to sites that link to you, the more your SEO rank could increase. This takes a lot of work, but could pay off very well. You have to find the links, tweet the links, follow up, etc. That's what you do for good links. But then there's also bad links. Again, every technique that SE of SEO that has worked, 
eventually gets abused. Once everyone finds out about it, well, the spammers, the scammers, they're going to use those techniques and go one step above. So when keywords, simple keywords, were the best way to get found on search, the spammers thought, okay, let's put all the keywords, because it's got to apply to at least someone. So then now keywords are less prominent. Uh, some say pretty much worthless nowadays because they've been so abused. Keywords. Uh, so a good thing now is, okay, links to links to your site. That could get abused as well. There's software that you can buy or uh, robots that you can program that will create 10 websites, a thousand websites, and they all link back to your website. You can pay for that. Now, of course, then those are fake websites, meaningless websites pointing to my website. That's not good. Uh, a few years ago, uh, when I was teaching this, uh, this class, I would have a student that would come in that he would um, still be stuck in the old ways, in the old days, really about keywords. And he was always telling his fellow students, anyone that was around, like, I've got this software and it's so affordable that will like get you a hundred backlinks. See me after class. So um, I would not recommend that. I would not recommend getting software that will get you more backlinks. Because again, it's about quality, not quantity. You might have five backlinks, but if four of them are from like the number one voice in uh, technology, that's better than having a thousand links from spam bots. So don't go into any of those link building schemes. If the search engines find out you're doing that, you'll get penalized. You might have been on the first page, and then you uh, you might have been on this on the fourth page, you use this technique and you got back to the number one, but then Google finds out and now you're on page 101. So don't use the bad techniques. Um, but we also have to deal with, there might be guilt by association. You may be linked to by a bad site, but you didn't solicit it, you didn't ask for it, you don't want it, it's a bad spam site that is linking to your site for some reason. You could get penalized if you've got bad links to your site. If you've got spammer websites linking to your site, that could hurt you. Guilt by association, it's unfortunately guilty until proven innocent because these techniques are abused. <clears throat> and here's how to prove your innocence. Both Bing and Google have something called disavow links. This is to say I don't know what they're about. They don't represent my business. Uh, don't pay attention to them. I'm disavowing those links. And here I show exactly where to go to set that up. I want to show that to you on Bing at the moment, but uh, any questions so far on this document? So when you go to inbound links and something shows up and you look at it and it doesn't look very kosher, you just look at this about. Exactly, exactly. You need to put the time and the effort to go to your inbound links, check them out, this looks bad, then we'll disavow. It's not automatic. So I'm going to go back to Bing. I'm going to go look at my um, reports and data, inbound links. Let's say, for example, that I'm looking at the home page here. And maybe, not saying it is, but I'm let's say maybe this loveandloathingla.com is some sort of uh, you know cheapcanadianmeds.com type of website that it's going to sell you something weird. It's not a good site. It shouldn't be linking to my site. There's no relevance. So the way we deal with it is, according to my PDF here, uh, we're going to go to configure my site right here under configure my site. Disavow links. 
So if I go to disavow links, we have a few options at the top. Uh, we can do page, directory, domain. If we select page, we would do something like this. HTTP bad site.com slash blog slash textcoco.html. I'm putting here an address that I found that was that one page that is bad and it's pointing to my site. So I've got it on page and I select disavow. Most likely that's not going to be enough. Most likely the whole site, everything about the site is a scam or spam. So I would say domain, wipe out the whole thing, the whole bad site.com, whatever's in it, it can't be trusted. Select disavow, and then the whole site will be disavowed. Not exactly sure. It's probably one of these trade secrets that the search engines don't exactly tell you about. Um, I can't, I can't exactly say. I've got an example here for this particular uh, client. Um, so back in, uh, in August, uh, last time I taught the class, um, I, sh I did this example, pick2fly.com. This is some sort of website that kind of like steals everyone's pictures and puts it in their own little search engine, a total scam site. So I put, uh, I put that in there and it's been disavowed since then. So I don't know when it you know, followed through, but now if I look at my inbound links, pick to fly doesn't appear anymore. If they were to go to that site and click on your link, would it take you to your site, or does it, does it disable the link? It still visits your site, but the point of this is that Bing and Google will not will not will not uh, weigh will this will not affect your SEO now. The link will still exist, and if people do go to the site. They'll still see a link to my site, and they can still click it, and they'll still come to my site, but it won't affect my site in a negative or positive way. And the point of this is to do it because it's a negative site. So usually what you're going to be doing on this is domain. I rarely do page, and I rarely do directory. Directory is something like that where it's badsite.com slash blog. Everything in the blog is bad, but for some reason everything else in the product section is good. Unlikely. The whole site is probably bad. So you'll usually be dealing with the whole domain. Similar? The Google tool is actually more complicated because Google has such a much of a larger market share. I suppose a lot of people accidentally use this tool wrong and really mess themselves up. So now the Google method I have here, there's no direct link when you log into your Google Analytics or Google Webmaster tool. I have not found anywhere there where you can click and it goes to the disavow tool. You basically have to go to this link directly here or do a Google search for Google Disavow Tool, and you'll get that link. So first of all, you know, you want to get in, but there's no front door. You have to climb in through the window. And second, to actually use the tool, and I'll show how it looks like in a moment, you have to upload a file that has a list of all of your bad domains and an explanation that you've already tried to handle this on your own. So Bing just says, yeah, here's the bad site, disavow it, done. If you make a mistake, delete it. You know, take it back. Google, because they've got 60% market share, if you disavow something that actually was helping you, it's going to be very bad. So they give you all of these hoops to jump through first before it works. And I'll show that in a moment. But all the instructions are here. So this is an important thing. Uh, my company, we do it for our clients on a regular basis, once a month, during the time that we're going to prepare their report. We log in to Bing and uh, Google, 
we go through here, we compare, this is a new link, this is a new link, these are old links, this is a good link, this is a bad link, and then we deal with the bad links. So this is not automatic. You do have to do it yourself. Once a month is good. What reason would a bad side want to connect to your site? Um, the, um, the purpose of a bad site can vary. Some want traffic to then be sold uh, to a third party. Like I've got a website that links to a bunch of sites, and therefore it has some traffic because people are always going to accidentally go through a bad site. So a company could then use that as they want to sell their site to another party and, and it shows we've got this traffic. Uh, advertising also. Uh, as it analyzes the different, as the bad site analyzes your site and sees your site is, is a restaurant, you could put ads on the sides about restaurants and then a link to your site to make it seem more legitimate. So this is basically all of these bad sites are often around to trick people. It often happens that you, that you try to go to an address and you go to the wrong address. You try to go to Facebook and you go to fakebook.com on accident. And then that's got links to a bunch of sites and you accidentally click an ad and now they've got some money for the ad click. So um, just basically these sites are here to trick people. And speaking of which, did you know did you know that if you um, if you, if you go to the address facecrook.com, it goes to Facebook. It's pretty deep. The real Facebook site. Um, okay, so let's let me log into Google and kind of see you show you how this looks like by, by through Google's tools. Um, the Google Webmaster tools, in my experience, have not been very useful for finding these backlinks. Uh, from my experience, the main reason of Google Webmaster tools is to check if your site, the the health of your site, if the links are working, if the server is working, that sort of thing. I haven't really found it useful for the backlink, so I'm not going to do that one. You can do it if you want. But I'm going to log into my Google Analytics and show you how that looks like.
All right, so um, I manage a lot of sites, so it, there's a lot of data here. But if I look at one of these, uh, so Google Analytics <laughs> overview here. This is another very useful tool. Uh, one of the ones you want to set up as soon as possible. When we get to the to the open lab portion, I can help you out if you need it. Basically, it was how we set up Bing. But this is connect. Uh, this is connected to this client's site, and it's showing some information, which I'll I'll explain what this stuff is. Uh, we've got sessions, uh, which are basically hits. These are the hits that were within this past period: six thousand four hundred fifty-seven hits. Users: five thousand three hundred fourteen. So that's um, a particular user um, could um, could go to your site more than could go to your page more than once or more than one page. That's why we've got page views nearly thirteen thousand. So five thousand users went to a variety of pages of multiple times, and that's about thirteen thousand page views this month. Uh, New sessions shows that out of all of the traffic that we got, 6,500 sessions or so, so far, 78% of them were new users, so new people coming to the site. That's good. You want to have, well, it depends on your site, you want to have new people coming to your site because you get more traffic, maybe sell more products, etc. Uh, you don't have to have a high new session, new sessions value. Let's say you're a blogger and you have a dedicated pool of a thousand followers that always come every month. Maybe your new sessions is pretty low, ten percent. But your sessions itself is ten thousand, and your page views are twenty thousand. So these are not values that they have to be at a particular rate. It depends on your site. But sessions are basically the total number of sessions within the date. A session is the period time a user is actively engaged with your website. Question. Do you recommend we wait, wait, wait. 30 days? Hey, there was a question hand before you. Question. Uh, it's track because it says put this code on every page and intend to track. Would you put it on every page or would you just put it on the home page? What's your recommendation? That I would put it on every page, but if you put it into your WordPress template like we did with Bing, it will automatically put it on all your pages. That's the point of, a, of a, something like WordPress. It's based on templates, so whatever you do to one will affect all. So if you don't have that capability, you'll have to manually put that Google code on all of the pages. And I recommend on all of the pages, so it gives you the full picture of data. Question? Um, do you recommend we look at uh, one month at a time? Or? To start off with, look at one month and then spread the spread the data out so you can see trends over time, but at least one month. And how do you put that code in that you were talking about? Well, that'll be, um, that'll be something that, uh, that was the homework that I gave last time that people can try on your own, or uh, during the lab time I can help people out okay. with that. So what else do we have here? Page, pages per session. So this is saying how many different pages are people going to on your site when they visit your site. This says two. Now on the site there's like uh, 20 pages. So why isn't that 19? I want people to visit every page in my site. Again, you have to think about what's relevant to people. This is a restaurant. The most relevant things more, most likely are the, the page about order now, uh, book a table, let's say. It can tell us what those pages are in a moment. But this is saying that on average, when people visit my site, they visit two pages. If you're a blogger, that your main, the main content of your site is your blog posts, I do want to get that higher. I want people to go to my different pages. Average session duration. How long are people at my site? This one says 1 minute 47 seconds. Again, what, you have to think about what are people going to do on my site buy some tacos. Uh, if they're done with it and then they if they've done that and then leave the site in under two minutes, that's fine. 
If I'm a blogger, though, and people are taking two minutes on my site, they're not reading my content. That's not so good. Bounce rate is the percentage of single page visits. Uh, for example, visits in which the person left your site from the entrance page without interacting with the page. That is, that someone goes to my site, they see the front page, and then they bounce. They leave. They don't do anything else. They don't go to Buy Now, they don't go to About Us, they don't click on anything. They just leave. And obviously the lower bounce rate, the better. I hear oftentimes a good metric to shoot for is under 30%. 30% bounce rate. Now this one's almost double that, 60%. That's bad, right? Again, it depends on my site. They come to my site, they go to the front page and do what they need to on the front page, or the entry page, technically, and then they leave. That's fine. Maybe people bookmark the Order Now page, that's their entry page. They went to the Order Now page, and then they ordered, and then they left. High bounce rate, that's fine. They accomplished what I needed them to do. If I've got a blog, and I want them to read everything, and I've got a 60% bounce rate, that's not good. Question. All that they've done is they've clicked on my site, yeah. clicked nothing else, and then left. Yes. Hang on. How about scoring or something like that? Hmm. Complete the front page by clicking or... Good question. I don't think scrolling counts. It's because it says here, in which a person left your site without interacting, which means usually click. So scrolling doesn't count, I guess. You have to click on something. But this is that they didn't click anything and they left. That was the bounce. So this overview page, audience overview, Google Analytics is very powerful, but it's very cumbersome. There's just a lot to look at. And the more you use it, the more it makes sense. Because right now, I'm under the audience section overview. And then there's a section down here for acquisition overview behavior overview, conversions overview. Each one has its own little section. I'm looking at audience overview and I've seen these sessions. If I scroll down, I've got demographics. Um, I'm currently looking at language, and I can select all of these, but language overview says that 82% uh, of people that visit my website, they are, they have, they're looking at it in English. That is, they're web browser at least is in English. Uh, specifically English US. Second, 4% is Espanol. Third is Espanol from España. So Spanish, Sp Spanish from Spain is the third most uh, demographic. ES from 419, and I looked that up, that's basically Latin America. Uh, number five is Spanish from Mexico. Next is English in general. And then Spanish from the US. And then English from GB. Where's GB? Great Britain. Great Britain, England. And then we have PTBR. Anyone know that one? Portuguese in Brazil. What about ESXL? <laughs> it's Spanish from, I think it's an island somewhere. ESXL language code. This is like a cool name of a band. ESXL. Spanish of Latin America in general, I guess. Okay, so this is showing me that information. I can look at it by country, number one US, number two Mexico, then Canada, Brazil, etc. India, 10th place. Cities. So right now, in this time period now, it's, it's happened now, that Los Angeles has overtaken traffic. Uh, we've reached the ticket, this company has reached the tipping point. Uh, Texcoco is, uh, was founded in, this client was founded in, in Tijuana in 1990. 
Then they came to San Diego, Chula Vista, in 2008, I think. And then in, in the beginning of this year, February, they opened a new location in Los Angeles. So they've expanded. Uh, and between February and today, let's say last month, between February and last month, the main traffic was coming from San Diego. Now, at this point, more traffic is coming from L.A. Because also, according to my backlinks report, I'm getting a lot of, the restaurant is getting a lot of hype from local L.A. websites and blogs. The L.A. Weeklies had um, articles and other locals. So now, more traffic is coming from Los Angeles to the site than San Diego. But if we add up San Diego and Chula Vista, though, then it's just about the same. Mexico City. Because... Texcoco is a city near Mexico City where the recipe of this food comes from. So uh, people are coming from there. Newport Beach for some reason. I don't know why. Honolulu. Traffic from Honolulu. That's interesting. San Francisco. Long Beach. New York. Oh, okay. It's harder to go to akiastexcoco.com. Um, so a lot of data can be found here. I'm not going to look at everything, but in general, browser, you can look at what are the most popular uh, web browsers, uh, computer web browsers. So Chrome and Safari are, are pretty close together. Internet Explorer, number three. The point of this is that people um, ask in general when they're doing web design or when they're, or when they're, set, or when they're setting up web development they ask well what are the standards what should I follow what are the what's the most popular browser etc uh, and I can give you statistics about general internet traffic but that might not really apply to your particular internet traffic that's why we want to set this up so that we can know what web browsers are most popular etc etc like right here, I wouldn't have thought Internet Explorer was number three. I might have thought Firefox is number three. The IE is number three. And the second is Android. People are on their smartphone. Opera, Amazon Silk. So people on their Kindle and such. Blackberry, believe it or not. <laughs> They're still <laughs> doing some traffic. <traffics. laughs> and so operating system, Windows, number one iPhone, number two, Android, number three, the Mac, etc. Linux. How do we just not set on each browser? Is there a reason? Yeah, uh, sometimes a computer is not properly configured, or sometimes a computer, a person configures their computer in a certain way for, for privacy or anonymity. Uh, this, remember, this is traffic that Google is seeing as it analyzes your site. So a person that visits the site that has, uh, that goes through your site via like an anonymizer service would not be displaying some of this information. So service provider, I don't know what, uh, I, this is interesting to know, but I don't, I haven't really figured out why I would want to know this. Service provider, what, what are, uh, what's the service provider that people are using to connect to the website? Second place is AT&T. Third is Time Warner. Fourth is Cox. Number one is not set, which I don't know about that. That's the mystery. That's the mystery. Who's visiting the site from not set? Verizon, Sprint. I guess part of the reason you might, well, I think Dish would show up here. I think part of the reason you might look at this is to figure this out. I'm seeing, okay, T Mobile, cell phone. Sprint, cell phone. Verizon, oh. cell phone. So I'm seeing. These three are cell phone providers. These three, these the service corporation, that sounds fake. But these three right here, those are those are cable providers. So right here, I could look at this to see eventually what's the tipping point of more people visiting on mobile than on desktop, to maybe get a better mobile experience. I can look here, mobile operating system. So iPhone. 1.9 and Android 1.6. Remember, this is just in the 30-day time period I've got it set up. If I put it for 90 days, 300 days, I get a better overview of my data. Windows, Windows Phone. 
It's probably me logging in all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Blackberry, Series 40, Nokia, Symbian, service provider on mobile, etc. Screen resolution. So the highest uh, number here are, are the sort of like the middle, middle quality phones are the highest ones. So people going in on middle, middle to low quality phones. Number three is higher quality phones. Number 10, not a lot of traffic yet on these HD phones, but eventually maybe. And then the point of that is to figure out, are my graphics high quality enough? Are my graphics retina ready? And such. Yes? So somebody's looking at their TV and they have internet access, mm -hmm. that goes through cable or is that... That would go through cable, and you would see it under operating system. It would say um, the name of the. That might be under not set, actually. But yeah, this should show you in detail. If you're getting a significant amount of traffic, it should show you um, what it is. Go to it on your Wii and all of that. Um, okay, so a lot of data to look at, but the one I want to look at at the moment, as I've got here, uh, finding your backlinks in Google Analytics. It's kind of complicated, so let me show you where it's at. This is um, uh, okay. So I'm looking at my particular site the property in the left navigation screen under acquisition so they call it under acquisition in the audience acquisition right here under acquisition we have um, all referrals here, all referrals this gives you then an overview of um, the traffic that you're getting from referrals actually let me back up here under acquisition let me show acquisition overview because there's a couple of terms here. Okay, I'm going to go back to acquisition overview first. Uh, I get a, a pie chart here uh, about uh, where what's where is my traffic coming from? Where am I acquiring my traffic from? Acquisitions, direct search, uh, organic search. So people searching these words, phrases, keywords, whatever, I, and the largest percent comes from that, 65% organic, direct search, the second chunk, 18%, which is that people go to the site directly. They type the, the address directly. Referral, that it comes referred from another site. The Zagat blog has a link referring them back to my site. That's a referral, 10% or 11%. They count differently here, social. They don't mix Twitter and Zagat together. They have Zagat as their own pie chart, pie slice, and uh, referral as another. So anything from Facebook, Twitter, social media has its own section. Other, not exactly sure where other is coming from. And then email. If we send out email marketing campaigns that has a link, that link could take you back to the site, and it's marked there. Notice in this one, I don't have any that say there would be another one if you run paid campaigns, AdWords, and all of that. There would also be the paid pie. So just as a quick overview here, the largest percentage of traffic is coming from organic search, second is direct, then referrals and social. So now, to see what those referrals are, it's under acquisition. All referrals gives you an overview of the sites. So within this time period, sessions and then new sessions and new users, there were 155 hits from Zagat for this time period, 153 from the LA Times, 131 from Yelp, and then Yelp Mobile, from Eater.com, and then it's showing percentage of new. I like this. Look at these high percentage values. I want new traffic. 
I'm getting new traffic from these refer referrals or referrers from Zagat, from LA Times, etc. And it tells you everything. Bounce rate, pretty low bounce rates. That's what I like to see there. So those bounce rates are coming from those referrers. They visit, in this case, just about three sites, three pages per, per visit. For how long? Etc. Okay. To see more of the data, that's in general. On the right side under the source column is a list of the sites that link to you. If you click on each, you will get more detail, even the exact page you're linked from. So, okay, what, Zagat, what are they linking? Where are they linking me from? So if you click on any of your sources here, there's San Diego's 10 notable tacos, the best tacos in 15 U.S. cities, 10 hot San Diego events to look forward to this fall, and best ice cream in San Diego. So I tweeted this link earlier. So when I check the statistics later, I could see that that might have increased to 5 or 10 or whatever. It, would have, it might have increased. That's how I'm showing the boss, the client, that what we're doing is working. This is the data that shows why our services are worth a certain value. That's how you can show, if you're trying to get hired, that you are you are um, worth how much you're, you're charging because I tweeted something and I can see it here this is what the result was so this is where I find my backlinks this is where I find who's linking to me And then I could start the process about, okay, I found a good link, then I'm going to Facebook about it. My followers could then follow that link. That goes back to my site, positive SEO chain. If there were bad backlinks, then there's the procedure here to disavow links. You can either click that link in the PDF or, because I never remember the exact link, you can just search Google disavow tool. You can use Google search to search Google to find Google disavow tool. Google Disavow tool, just search for it, you should get the result. And again, it's not easy to get to this because you could have bad consequences. If you believe your site's ranking is being harmed by low-quality links that you do not control, you can ask Google not to take them into account when assessing your site. You should still make every effort to clean up unnatural links pointing to your site. Simply disavowing them isn't enough. If you, if you read m more info, there's a huge essay here about what you need to do. Again, it's not just as simple as copying and pasting the link. Basically, what you, what you have to do is you have to know that this is an advanced feature. It should be used with caution. And then what it says is you need to basically create a file, a simple text file, and in there copy and paste all of the bad links. And also write explanation. It's sort of like showing your work. So here, example.com removed most links but missed these. So then you link to those pages. Contacted owner of shadyseo.com on this date to ask for link removal but got no response. So you put domain and then the website. And then you upload it. So you can put the site. Notice what the example showed right here. If you want to put a site, you have to put it like this. Domain, colon, and then the site.
<clears throat> so you could do that on your own. Uh, if you've got those bad links, you want to disavow them. But it takes more effort in uh, Google. And do you have to keep your list of which sites you have and update the list? Yeah, that's why, that's why they give you the option up here, export. They give you the option to export this data and then you should be taking care of it and on a monthly basis you should be checking if the if the link was removed and it's gonna be up to you to to keep track of it to update it All right, so if you haven't set up your Google or Bing uh, Webmaster tools, this is why you want to do so as soon as you can to start getting this data. We've talked about what's the importance of this data, what to do with it. Question. Okay. So um, at this point, I'm going to end the main lecture so that we can have some lab time. A lot of people have individual questions, and that's usually at a certain point that's the best thing for this type of class. You've got the, you've got this PDF and the other ones. I'll turn on the printer in a moment, but uh, I'm going to wrap up the main lecture. We'll do some lab time. Any general questions?